Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing uh, the 5-HT3 receptors. Okay, so in this video what we're going to do is describe an experiment where you build a chimera, basically. So, a chimera is an ancient word which basically means uh, two things moulded together. So, uh, for instance, in Harry Potter, when you have the hippogriff, where it has the eagle's head and then a horse's body. That is a chimera of an eagle uh, with a horse. So it's two things, uh, two things from different species merged together. Okay, so it's a chimera. Right, so we're going to do the same analogous thing in the world of proteins. Okay, so we have seen this 5-HT3A protein, okay, which was an example of a cis-loop ligand-gated ion channel protein subunit. Okay, so we could assemble five of these together to make uh, a 5-HT3A uh, homopentamer. Now, basically, there is another great family of cis-loop ligand-gated ion channels, which are the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Okay, and there are absolutely uh, loads of subunits that make up the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. So basically, this is another uh, cis-loop ligand-gated ion channel. So again, if I draw its structure, okay, if I draw the structure of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, it's made up of five uh, receptor subunits, okay? So five proteins overall make up the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, just like was the case uh, for uh, the 5-HT3 receptors. In addition, if we take one of these subunits out and look at its structure, look at its membrane-spanning topology, again, it has this cis loop at its amino terminus, like so. Then it has these four membrane-spanning domains named M1, M2, M3, M4. Okay, and then here is its carboxyl terminus. So basically, the subunits that make up the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor have this very similar structure to the uh, subunits that make up the 5-HT3 receptors. Okay, right. Now, uh, there are absolutely loads of genes which uh, code for the protein subunits of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor pentamer. So there is actually 17 genes. So where should I put this? 17 genes, okay? And uh, they are grouped into families to help us understand this. So we group them into the alpha family, which has the alpha 1 protein all the way down to the alpha 10 protein. So all of these proteins are separate nicotine, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor protein subunits. Okay, then we have the beta family, which contains four genes, beta 1 through beta 4. Okay, so beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, beta 4. And then finally, we also have the gamma subunit, the delta subunit, and the epsilon subunit. So those are all of the genes now, all 17 genes, which code for slightly different proteins, um, which can all uh, take one of these slots in the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Okay, uh, so you've got 10 of these alpha ones, four of these beta ones, and then these three here, the gamma, the delta, and the epsilon nicotinic acetylcholine receptor protein subunits. Right, now, there is a huge, absolutely huge number of different ways of taking these subunits and building a pentamer out of them. Absolutely huge, and these have been studied very extensively, so we know a lot about them. Now, one of the major forms that is found within the brain okay, is made up of five alpha-7 subunits. So you take alpha-7, which is one of these protein subunits in the alpha family, and you take it and you basically make five copies of this protein and you stick them together, one in each of these sockets, to make an alpha-7 times five homo pentamer. Okay, and this sort of a structure is found within the brain. Okay, right. So, let me tell you just a little bit more about how it binds ligand, basically, because this is quite an interesting nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. 
Okay, so if we look at it from the top, if I draw a big picture of the channel looking at it from up here, okay, then what we see is we'll see the pore in the middle, which may or may not be open, okay, and then we have these five subunits making up the alpha 7 homopentamer, okay, and basically what you find is that each one of these subunits has uh, certain domains within it, certain motifs known as the A loop. So this is the A loop. Then another one next to it known as the B loop. And then another one here known as the C loop. And then on this other side, what it has is the D loop, the E loop, and the F loop. Now, these motifs within the alpha 7 protein and they're in other nicotinic acetylcholine receptor protein subunits as well although not all of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor subunits will have all six of them but in alpha 7 you have all six of these motifs the a b c d e and f and they are known as the loops okay the a loop the b loop the c loop the d loop the e loop and the f loop now, we now have the X-ray crystallography uh, structure of um, this protein, and we know that the A, B, and C loops really are loops, whereas the D, E, and F loops aren't actually loops. Instead, they are beta-pleated sheets. So this is an example of where the nomenclature hasn't kept up with the um, crystal structures, basically. However, they are still referred to as the D, E, and F loops. Now, why is this important? Well, basically, these loops are the portions which make up the binding domains for acetylcholine. Now, if one alpha-7 subunit has all of these six motifs, and all five of the alpha-7 subunits, alpha subunits in this homopentamer has all six of these motifs, then what's going to happen? Well, this one down here, this next one, this will have the D, E, and F motif here. And now you've got all six of them together, and this basically makes an acetylcholine binding site. So when you've got all six of the motifs together like so, that makes an acetylcholine binding site. So this circle in pink is an acetylcholine, which I'll abbreviate to ACH, binding site. Okay, now... What's going to happen is because all of these are identical, this alpha-7 subunit here will also have the A, the B, and the C loop. And then the next one on will then have the D, the E, and the F loop. So you'll get another acetylcholine binding site here. And basically, I hope you can see that this is going to continue on. You're going to get another acetylcholine binding uh, domain here, another acetylcholine binding site over here, and another acetylcholine binding site over here to overall give you five acetylcholine binding sites. And indeed, this alpha-7-5 homopentamer does indeed bind five acetylcholine molecules. And when it has those five acetylcholine molecules, it will open. And again, just like the 5-HT3 receptor, it is permeable to cations. The difference in this case is that it's uh, far more permeable to calcium than the 5-HT3 receptors were. So the alpha-7-5 homopentama has a relatively high uh, calcium permeability. High calcium permeability. Okay, but it's still very permeable to sodium and potassium as well, so that will be important. And uh, the alpha-7-5 homopentama, uh, just a fun fact, is the one which is in the brain and seems to be involved in uh, the addiction process that occurs um, for nicotine. So nicotine binds to these acetylcholine binding sites and will activate the receptor just like acetylcholine. Okay, And uh, this seems to be involved in the addiction process, but we'll discuss that more in later videos. Okay, now on with this experiment then. What are we going to do? How are we going to build a chimera? Well, basically, what we're going to do is 
You remember me telling you that the structure of the uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor subunit, or let's have this as our alpha-7 subunit specifically, it's very similar to the structure of the 5-HT free receptor. In fact, the picture I've drawn is identical. So basically, what we're going to do is we're going to take our 5-HT free A receptor subunit, so we're specifically now working with the 5-HT free A subunit. The reason being that we want a homopentamer as well. So 5-HT3A forms beautiful homopentamers, so does alpha-7, so it's all working nicely together. So, what we're going to do is we're going to chop off this extracellular domain here, okay? We're then going to take the transmembrane domains of uh, this 5-HT3A protein, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to take our alpha-7 protein, we're going to chop off the extracellular domain, and we're going to stick that to the transmembrane domain of our 5-HT3 receptor. So basically, what we're going to end up with is something that looks like this. Okay? So yes, it looks exactly like uh, the non-chimeral form, but let me colour it in to make it more obvious. So, the green bit came from our alpha-7. Okay, so here's the green bit. And this blue bit here came from the um, 5-HT3A protein. Now, this green bit is involved in the ligand binding site. Okay, and so it's involved in all of this, this extracellular face which acetylcholine interacts with. And these, these transmembrane regions, they are responsible for actually conducting the ions. Specifically, it's this M2 membrane spanning um, portion, which actually lines the pore. So if you were a little ion moving through the pore, the region of this protein that you would actually brush up against for all five of these subunits would be the M2 um, membrane spanning portion, basically. Okay, so this is our chimera, basically, of alpha-7 and 5-HT3A. Uh, so it's a alpha-7, 5-HT3A chimera. Now, what we can do is we can try and make proteins out of this. Well, we can, sorry, we can try and make receptors out of this. We can let this pentamerize together. We can make homopentamers of it and see if it functions. And indeed it does. So, basically, I'm trying to stress how similar these two um, proteins are, basically. The alpha-7 protein and the 5-HT3A protein are very, very similar. They make a homopentamer when you make this chimera of the two, and it's going to have properties that are mixed between the two. So, basically, it will be activated uh, by uh, acetylcholine, okay? and nicotine, just like the alpha-7 homopentamer. So its agonists for, it, for this channel to open will be acetylcholine and nicotine. So basically what we're doing is we're making this chimera protein, we're making a homopentamer of them, and then what we're going to see is if this ligand-gated iron channel that we've made actually works. So we expose it to acetylcholine and what do we find? It opens. So it will open in response to acetylcholine. It will also open in response to nicotine, another agonist of the alpha-7 uh, homopentamer. Okay? It will not, it will not open in response to 5-HT anymore. So it's not 5-HT selective anymore. So cross 5-HT out there. And that's because we've removed the ligand binding domain for 5-HT that the 5-HT3A receptor had. We've only taken the bit that actually forms the pore of 5-HT. The bit that is uh, recognizing the ligand is now uh, recognizing acetylcholine and nicotine rather than 5-HT. Uh, In addition, it's sensitive to antagonists of the alpha-7 receptor rather than antagonists of uh, the 5-HT receptor. So what antagonists do we have of the alpha-7 receptor? Well, basically, examples of antagonists, i.e. competitive antagonists, which will bind to these 
uh, acetylcholine binding sites and then block the binding site from the acetylcholine. An example of that is alpha-bungarotoxin. Okay, so alpha-bungarotoxin is a toxin found in the venom of certain snakes. And basically, it's a competitive antagonist of many different types of nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, including those at skeletal muscle, uh, on skeletal muscle cells. And at the skeletal muscle cells, it's going to um, stop the acetylcholine from activating the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors and thereby paralyze the prey. Alpha-75 um, alpha homopentamers are not on skeletal muscle cells, but alpha-bungarotoxin is still effective against these uh, receptors. So alpha-bungarotoxin is also often referred to as alpha-BGTX. Okay, another example of a competitive antagonist for these alpha-7 receptors is a drug known as methyl -lyca 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 acomatine. Sorry, my voice is going. Methyl lycoconitine. Lycoconitine. Okay, I struggle with the pronunciation of that um, drug anyway. So, methyl lycoconitine. Okay, right. Uh, so, these antagonists work against our chimeric receptor. So, they will block acetylcholine or nicotine from being able to activate our uh, chimeric receptor. So, this experiment serves to highlight that it is this amino terminal extracellular domain which is the ligand binding domain which interacts with the pharmacological agonists and the pharmacological antagonists. Okay, in the next video we'll continue this discussion by talking about the 5-HT receptor antagonists and how those do not work on these chimeric receptors.